Welcome to the second uh, session of this morning, the third session of this uh, conference. I'm very happy to introduce our keynote speaker for this uh, session, His Excellency Reverend Dr. James Christie, the Ambassador at Large, Canadian Multi Faith Federation. He was Professor of Whole World Ecumenism and Dialogue Theology former Dean of the Faculty of Theology and the Director of the Ridd Institute for Religion and Global Policy. Um, the topic of his presentation is, uh, as I told you, very, I'm very curious about it. Um, waking to God's dream. So this is surely going to be a fascinating talk. <laughs> May I just indulge in a brief sound check? Am I being clearly heard at the far end of the table? I have a tendency to mumble. I'm actually very good at it, but uh, it does make speaking sometimes rather difficult for those who are attempting to hear. So, shalom, salam, good morning, and of course, namaste. Ma, one of my mentors was the late and great Rabbi Jordan Croson who uh, practiced his rabbinate in Toronto for many, many, many years uh, at the Portuguese synagogue, as I recall. And um, Jordan was fond of beginning every address he was invited to give by saying, before I begin to speak, there are a few things I would like to say. And I'm going to echo uh, Reb Burleson this morning, because there are a couple of things that need to be said. And they are mostly by way of gratitude. The first, of course, is to is gratitude to the uh, the four uh, sponsoring organizations which have worked so diligently to bring us together here today in Tel Aviv, tomorrow in Yerushalayim. Uh, and I, I have to say that just looking around the table, I realize what an extraordinary blessing it is to be in your company. So my second point after a great appreciation to the organizers and my long time and good friends and newer friends as well, is to say thank you to all of you. As I say, it's, it is such a privilege to be in your, your midst. Uh, and um, I think that's actually all I really wanted to say to begin with. And now to move into the topic. Um, our moderator noted that she was intrigued by the topic uh, waking to God's dream, not from, but rather to God's dream. And I trust that this may become relatively clear over the next uh, dozen or so, still perhaps almost 15 minutes. I'd like 18. to be 18, 18 minutes. Ganoon never gives me 18 minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now 16. <laughs> Have you got it all out? <laughs> I'd like to begin by some observations, perhaps call them meditations on three books and a book. All of them in the relatively early 20th century. The first one by the Harvard historical philosopher, Steven Pinker. Some of you may be familiar with it. And it was taken, its title was taken from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address, as I recall which refers to the better nature of uh, the better angels of our nature. And that is the title of Pinker's massive doorstopper of a book in which he uh, does his level best to try and articulate that the world really is in a much better position overall, despite obvious problems and setbacks and continuing injustices than it has ever been. More people are alive, more people are, largely speaking, taken care of by way of food, more people, but, but Pinker expressed this, this sense of progress as a genuine and observable reality in a truly lovely way. And I wanted to believe it. Second book was, as I recall, published in 2009, and I should explain that my quotes will sometimes be not precise. My library, after two and a half years, almost a pandemic, is still in lockdown in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I've been in Montreal. But the second book in lockdown uh, 
was uh, by um, Jeremy Rifkin. It was, I believe, published in 2009 and is entitled The Empathic Civilization. Uh, the Empathic Civilization was in some respects limited. It really is a largely Western European and Northern view of the world, but Rifkin argues in ways analogous to Dr. Pinker, that in fact, the world and human beings are wired to be empathetic and to be able to feel, as the gospel suggests of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a compassion that literally from the Greek twists your guts, a compassion you can really feel. Rifkin argued that this was, in fact, inevitable uh, in the course of human development, and that we could look forward to an era in which empathy became the dominating factor of human affairs. And it was beautifully written, and I wanted to believe it. And then 18 months ago, I began to read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. And I could no longer believe Pinker, at least nowhere near completely, nor Rifkin, nor Rifkin. If you're not familiar with Wilkerson's book, well, I said I began it sometime in 2021, early on, I'm still reading it because I find I can do perhaps a chapter a week. And what she illustrates is so horrific, so painful, so gut-wrenching it is impossible for me to simply keep on with the book. So I do about a chapter a week. Her essential thesis is that the issues that we face are great, and amongst them, racism is one of the greatest. But she pushes that beyond what she might describe as basic or even simple racism to the establishment and the promulgation and the maintenance of caste systems. She chooses, she chooses three to examine, perhaps the most surprising and the most devastating for those of us who consider our uh, cousins to the South, our good friends and neighbors, is her indictment of the slavery culture and the anti-Black feelings in the United States of America. Her second is the caste system that was established and imposed on completely fallacious grounds by the Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945 and the buildup that leads to that in Nazi Germany. And the third is the, certainly to outsiders, extremely puzzling understanding of caste in, in India. All three of the books are instructive, but there's one noticeable absence in all of the works, whether they are essentially supportive of the directions in which we are going or unsupportive. That is the element of the divine and the impact of global religions is really not much taken into consideration either for better or for worse, which brings me after three books to one more book. This one's a, a small book physically. One could slip it in one's pocket or pocketbook uh, quite happily read it in an evening if you didn't so much, uh, if you weren't so much captivated by the prose itself. And that is the uh, late and most blessed Archbishop Desmond Tutu's book, God Has a Dream. Now, the intriguing thing is that all the optimistic, not to say hopeful notes of both Pinker and Rifkin are echoed in Tutu. But so is the concern as well for all that that is yet to be overcome and that is devastatingly wrong in the human condition that we might find in Wilkerson's cast. Tutu's difference is that the future, he believes, as a profound Christian leader of the late 20th and early 21st century, is rooted in some measure in the precepts and the possibilities and, in fact, the dreams as he would call them, of the divine. And Tutu's conviction that God has a dream that is entirely in harmony with all of our best impulses, 
is an extraordinarily powerful little read. And what I'd like to note about that is that there are two, um, as I recall, this book is also in lockdown in Winnipeg, but as I recall, there are two, uh, I guess, um, fundamental understandings that one has to grasp. The first is that despite our many and varied understandings of the nature of the divine, of the nature of God, in the end, those are our issues, not God's issue. So that, that's really important. And there's an image I'd like to share with you, an image by the Reverend Dr., the very Reverend Dr. Bruce McLeod, who was moderator of the United Church, the youngest uh, in his day to be elected. And he said in his more senior years, not all that terribly long ago, that he used to think of God as being on the top of a mountain. And the world's great religions as teams of mountain climbers who were making their way up the mountain. Different tangents, different slopes, different approaches, different ascents. And he said, then one day I realized that that's not at all the case. God isn't somewhere out there at the top of an Everest to be reached. He said, as soon as I realized that God is the mountain, then my world changed in relation to world faiths. That's the second precept that Desmond, certainly in his last years, but I think instinctively throughout his life, understood that we are all inextricably linked in a vision, a dream that belongs to God. The other great thing that must be understood as well is that in contrast to Rene Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum, Desmond Tutu practiced and believed firmly in the principles of Ubuntu, which he once said really could be translated not as Descartes' worldview, but one that says, we are, therefore I am. And I would suggest that the two of those need to be kept in tandem, to be held as two dynamic uh, tensions uh, within, within one's mind and soul and, and heart. If I say nothing else, I rather hope that those observations be, would be worthwhile, but as Ganoon and Asher will tell you, it's rare that I don't say more, so I will. Uh, but we'll try to keep them uh, brief. I'm going to shift now uh, from the extraordinarily uh, dynamic and brilliant presentations we've heard so far this morning to a bit of recounting of praxis. Call them three superficial views of case studies, if you like. Each one is connected to the Canadian Multi-Faith Federation, whose greetings I bring to you here at uh, Shimon Peres Academic Center this morning as their uh, ambassador at large. Uh, and I defend the um, intruding of, uh, inserting of praxis issues into an academic conference, a scholarly conference, primarily because of a principle that I think is well worth keeping in mind that sometimes, perhaps often, in fact, it is better to act one's way into a new way of thinking rather than think one's way into a new way of acting. And so these are images that emerge as we begin to wake to God's dream, realizing it's not the complex optimism of Pinker, nor the emotive optimism of Rifkin, nor yet the terrible realism of Wilkerson, but rather it's how we stand in relation to the dream which is God's, and on our better days, perhaps, ours. So three ways in which the Canadian multifeather Faith Federation has been and drawn into this question of praxis for purpose uh, involve three serious and even tragic issues. The, uh, the first is that of the Indian so-called residential schools in Canada. And particularly thanks to the advent of ground penetrating radar, radar uh, the discovery first in Kamloops last year, early last year, of the remains of 215 Indigenous children in the heart of British Columbia. Uh, 
And this was a devastating uh, thing for the multi-faith federation. It was a devastating thing for Canadians and for the world who learned of it to realize. So the federation actually produced a statement in which they tried to capture what the thing, the experience was like for those who were both in long-standing, call them historic faith presences in, in presences in Canada, and those of new groups. And what I particularly like to read is one simple passage, um, which notes this. They speak of our historic members and their attempts to begin a process of recognition, reconciliation, and reparation. And then this paragraph. Many of our more recent members feel this tragic discovery especially keenly. They have come to Canada seeking refuge from persecution and in too many instances genocide in, in the, the, the two aspects of Lemkin's definition from 1944, one as simple extermination and the other as cultural genocide. Uh, in their countries of origin, they came believing Canada to be a beacon of hope and this most recent disillusionment is hard to bear. The, and the, the attempt to articulate what it means for Canadians of other faiths was first and engendered an ongoing dialogue, which is still being practiced from coast to coast to coast on the northern part of Turtle Island. The second episode is not entirely unlike it, though it's a story really more of, of hope, and that is in January of 2021, vaccines were on the horizon all over the world. They were on the horizon in Canada as well. But the, um, the Privy Council requested on behalf of Dr. Teresa Tam, who some of you might understand was Canada's Dr. Fauci during the pandemic, um, realized that if the rollout of vaccine was going to work, especially in communities that were small and more isolated and perhaps more resistant to both a disease and a remedy that was unfamiliar to them and to some extent often terrifying, uh, it would be worth consulting with religious leaders who might employ their credibility such as it remains after the last century in trying to support the vaccine rollout program. So on Dr. Tam's behalf, a number of us, including the CMF, drew together 1,300 religious and spiritual leaders from across the country, including 300 Aboriginal or Indigenous spiritual leaders, for an hour and a half in which Dr. Tam had an open round table and brought the religious leaders on board because she was convinced that if we were to be in touch with reality, not simply theory. The place to begin was in local communities. The third um, example of waking to God's dream that I'd like to share with you was an extraordinary thing that happened um, just this year, really. Back in February and into early March, Canada had a very long 6th of January. That is to say, for my American cousins, you'll recall what happened on Epiphany in 2020, um, 2021, with the attempted, uh, well, let's be daring, the attempted coup on Capitol Hill by supporters of the former president. We had just over three weeks of that in which the city of Ottawa, Canada's capital, and particularly its center, residences, businesses, and government, were brought to an absolute standstill by a convoy of hundreds and hundreds of 18-wheel trucks, plus local supporters who descended on the city and shut it down completely. Now, that was irritating enough, as one can imagine. Their uh, presenting issue was that they wanted COVID restrictions to to be ended, particularly the border between Canada and the United States of America. However, that quickly was dropped from their manifesto, and what was advocated was what was unspoken but presumed on the 6th of January uh, earlier in, the, in 2021, a year earlier, and that is that they intended to take over the government, bring it down, and put in their own people's representatives. And you can imagine some of the folk who were behind this and who funded this. And um, their objectives, as you can see, 
were well matched by the symbols and the slogans they used, which included a swastika and Confederate flags and uh, Stars of David trucking all the way across the country. Proud Boys, neo-Nazis, all there. And as a consequence, there was a response. Peter Julian, a member of parliament for the uh, New Democratic Party introduced a private member's bill in which he wanted to ban hate symbols. At the top of the list, he wanted to ban the swastika. Understood. But he really, of course, was mistaking the swastika, which is in Hinduism to a degree, of course, Buddhism, Jainism, and Zoroastrianism, a symbol of blessing, hope, and good fortune with the Hackenkreuz, which was the symbol modified by the Third Reich. And here is the, the cogent note. In order to try and put some degree of insight and balance into this, the president of the Hindu Federation worked with the external relations director of the uh, of CJA, which is uh, uh, the Committee for Israel and Jewish Affairs in Canada, to put together a joint petition to have the bill slightly modified so that the swastika itself was not labeled hate symbol. Hang on. I think if I can get 45 more seconds out of this. With all the intrusions from Ganoon and Ash. Um, the, um, the purpose was not to condemn the swastika per se as a hate symbol, but rather its employment and its corruption in the form of the Hackenkreuz of the Third Reich. Anyway, three instances in which it felt, and I think could be clearly discerned as moments when at least Canadian multi-faith communities began to wake to the dream that was God's. Now, it also is a dream of humanists, of people of no faith, but it's certainly a dream that can be appropriated and uh, claimed by people of faith. Just a, a last note about dreaming, really. Some of you, uh, particularly living in this part of the world, will recall the career fortunate or unfortunate of the late Thomas Edward Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. And the seven pillars of wisdom Lawrence wrote, and I paraphrase for purposes of inclusivity, we all dream. Those of us who dream in the dusty recesses of the night may wake to find that our dreams were but vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous, for they may act their dreams to make them happen. When we speak of dreams, Desmond Tutu's articulation of God's dream is surely one that we would want to contemplate and to borrow from Tanakh. Unless God sends a vision, the dreamer dreams in vain. Thank you. Hold on. Hold on. I promised fascinating. Ah, well, fun, I hope, and Absolutely. sort of on time. Except the mention of my name. <laughs> I'm sure the editors will take that out for you. Todaraba, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, now I'm happy to introduce our second speaker. Professor um, Shira Woloski from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem at Shalem College. Um, Professor Woloski teaches hermeneutics and English and American studies. She was previously an associate professor at Yale University. She received her PhD with distinction from Princeton University. She has authored numerous books on 19th century American poetry, feminist theory, literary criticism, and religion. Um, including Defending Identity, which she wrote with Natan Sharansky. Um, she uh, has won uh, awards, numerous awards, including Guggenheim, Fulbright, Princeton and Israel Institutes of Advanced Studies. Um, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, good. Thanks. So the title of um, her presentation is The Awe of the Other, Emmanuel Levinas' Discourse Ethics. Um, 
First, I want to say I am honored and so pleased to be here at a real conference with real people in such an international and important uh, topic that we all really care about. Um, Emmanuel Levinas's philosophy offers a radical critique and a radical proposal to urgent questions facing today's globalized world in which ever greater recognition of diversity co-resides with ever greater encounter, intertwining, and confrontation among different peoples and cultures. Levinas, on the one hand, insists on just such diversity and difference as itself a good, departing from longstanding traditions in which unity and universalism provided the core language of ethics and also of politics. But he also resists postmodern models in which difference is urged, but without normative guides to their interrelationship. Levinas's language philosophy, seen as a discourse ethics, suggests an ethics that upholds difference while safeguarding norms, a mode of normative difference, I would call it. In this, he addresses many issues taken up by Habermas, but avoids Habermas's ultimate appeal to a unity of reason as the basis of agreement, which is itself traditional. In Levinas instead, the very participation in discourse and the conditions for doing so offer a framework for positive encounter in a world of diversity and difference. Levinas's own difference from contemporary discourses can be dramatized with reference to the notion of the other. The other has emerged as a foundational term, often appealing to Levinas, but in fact, misunderstands Levinas's use of the term. Otherness is taken to signal victimization, degrading and oppression of minority groups. Otherness thus marks, do marks domination in a system of power as an undesirable condition, one that is ideally to be overcome. But if overcoming otherness is the solution, then difference is the problem and sameness the ideal measure. In Levinas, however, Otherness does not reduce, subordinate, exclude, or degrade. It instead marks transcendence, what stands beyond the grasp of the self, guarding against erasure of uniqueness as a limitation to structures of power rather than power's endless aggrandizement. The other in Levinas, far from asserting domination, is the mark of domination's limit, what resists reduction, whether to structure within social system and its distributions of power, or as an object grasped within cognition or technological knowledge. Otherness safeguards against possession of the other, preventing reduction. But how, if the other stands indelibly apart from the self, is there to be relationship to it? This question has a theological and metaphysical dimension, since otherness marks in Levinas an absolute transcendence he sees as manifested in Judaic tradition, as differing from traditional ontologies. However, here I want to examine its concrete social and political senses, which Levinas is often said to lack. How in society ourselves to address and respond to each other while at once respecting that otherness positively and not reducing it to categories either of universal sameness or sheer political power. I will propose that Levinas's philosophy offers a model for a discourse ethics, one that without prescribing a specific democratic politics establishes principles that justify democratic Republican politics in ethical terms that upholds the other as other without either unification or reduction to structures of power. Levinas and dis Levinasian discourse ethics redefines both selfhood and how selves interrelate with each other. And this goes back to the point that the theory of the self is a theory of society and vice versa. This is an early critique of autonomy of the self as self-referring and self-determining. He does not posit a subject as consciousness grounded in reason or other universal foundations, but he does not thereby propose dissolving selfhood into power structure as a binary opposition, which then only leads to resistance as a kind of emancipation, as is the case in Foucauldian critiques of autonomy. The self in Levinas is accountable, answerable, 
not as based in absolute self-determination. Answerability takes place through address and response to others distinct from the self. The answerable self is thus not autonomous, but interrelational within time, change and exchange, although not dissolved into them. There is no either or a fixed selfhood or radically fluid one as in Judith Butler. The self instead positively emerges through relationship to others while also committed to sustaining each one's distinctiveness and difference. Levinas's model for this ethical and also political interrelation of difference and commitment is language, which both serves as model and practice of address and response. To address is always already to respond because you receive your language from the culture you're in and respond to it. Each redresser thus is a responder and each responder is an addresser. This is the interchange that Levinas names saying. The self in address response is not merely self-governing as autonomous, nor merely governed by others as heteronymous. Rather in linguistic exchange, each being unfolds while remaining apart. Language crosses between the space of distinction, but does not close it over. External and between, language marks not the merging of minds, but their interchange and even crossfire. The most prominent form of discourse ethics is the one proposed by Habermas. Habermas's was an attempt to ground norms in discourse itself without recourse to a prior metaphysics claiming truth that discourse would only correspond to. Habermas, that is, wants a post-metaphysics that remains ethical and regulates meaning as Levinas does also. He would like to avoid the abstraction that eliminates historical context, individual specificity, variable contexts. Habermas attempts to bypass abstraction and admit context by situating ethics within discourse as conducted by individuals within historical situations. And yet his measure and test remains unanimity, consensus, a shared agreement where all accept the same understanding. And this agreement is itself possible because seen as sharing the same reason. It is rationality that makes common agreement possible and validates it, allowing all to achieve the same position. As Levinas writes of this model, quote, language consists in entering the thought of the other, in coinciding in reason and internalizing itself there. Reason would be the true inner life, reason is one. On one level, Habermasian agreement does happen through discourse. On the other, it remains grounded in a reason prior to discourse, which discourse should recognize and convey. Levinasian discourse ethics evades this recourse to universal reason. He does not assume individual access to universal reason as its basis, nor is its, me is its measure the agreement and unanimity that Habermas idealizes. What Levinas underscores is the positionality of the two interlocutors in linguistic relation to each other. Language takes place as the performance of an interlocutor addressing interlocutor, each in turn then responding to the other. More is involved in the formal structure of structural linguistics in which addresser and responder are positions or components of a linguistic structure. Instead, this is an act of intercommunication. The difference within relationality, which Levinas calls relation without relation, is the primary event of language. Discourse is not first a means for conveying information, nor of bringing to agreement regarding a truth or reference or understanding, nor is it achieved as common understanding which minds together join in rationality. This can happen and has its validity, but the, the, for Levinas, the relationship of discourse precedes understanding. The self and the other are not absorbed into shared ideas. Each is not transcended in a universalism that would abdicate their own histories, contexts, and individualities the individualities that make up the differences and distances that continue to distinguish the interlocutors. 
Transcendence itself means something different. Not to transcend difference, history and context, but to mark the other, what the self is not, as beyond its grasp or reducible to its terms. This is the awe of the other that safeguards its otherness within interchange. Ethics then is not a universalizing beyond cultural historical embodied individuality, nor reduction in an unregulated relativism only to the historical and cultural. It is grounded in discourse itself, that is in the conditions that make discourse possible, not in the agreement achieved, but the conditions that make discourse possible. And Levinas suggests two of them. The first is thou shalt not kill. He insists this is the primary instruction which humans have not ever obeyed. <laughs> and if you kill someone, you cannot address or respond to him or her. So it destroys discourse from the beginning. But the second, that's the harm principle in a discourse form. You can speak as long as you do not prevent or silence others from speaking. But a second condition is the conditions necessary for participation, which are positive. These require education, health, basic sustenance, and admission to the discourse exchange, without which there can no be discourse. So there's the negative liberty of the harm principle and the positive of the conditions for discourse itself. Can I take another minute? One minute. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. you have it. two more minutes. Okay. Does such discourse ethics extend from individuals to groups? Today, the recognition of cultural groups has become an urgent political and ethical concern. What is a group? In Levinasian terms, a group is necessarily made up of individuals who each emerge within cultural groups and may be more than one. It is not a self-defining autonomy of classical liberalism, nor abstraction, nor socially determined Foucauldian selfhood. The unique self emerges out of its cultural contexts, which are always changing. But Levinas sees these cultural contexts as positively enriching individuality, not requiring emancipation from it. And it is as cultural selves that each addresses and responds to the other, as particulars that take into account by respecting those differences and yet committing to each other as a common discourse scene for negotiating and uh, not killing each other and conditions of participation. Last paragraph. Levinas does not rely on rational agreement achieved in the Habermasian positing of an ideal speech situation where abstract reason ultimately governs, inhabited by selves, as Rawls puts it, under a veil of ignorance as to their cultural origins. In Levinas instead, it is the discourse situation itself entered into distinct selves within the groups they belong to that establishes an ethics of conditions of address and response, not killing and honoring, uh, which we humans do not honor, and that make discourse participation possible. This would not be measured by unanimity. Disagreement rather than consensus is intrinsic to the differences people bring to their exchanges. But the discourse ethics that language enacts does not erase or transcend such differences. Instead, it would conduct a society safeguarding distant differences and uniqueness. This is the awe of the other, not as a victim through structures of power, but as interlocutor, never to be fully understood or grasped, but rather addressed beyond the self, as made in the image of the divine, which Levinas emphasizes the image of the other, not yourself. Amazing move. And as he says, God created humans to have someone to talk to. Thank you. Thank you very much to Daraba for this presentation of Levinas's unique perspective. Um, and now I'm happy to introduce Omer Alon. Um, Omer Aloni from the Paris Academic Center Law School and the Spatz Academic College of Law. He earned his PhD 
from the Zvime Kao, the Center for Advanced Legal Studies at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. He's a researcher and a visiting professor in several universities. He is the author of The League of Nations and the Protection of the Environment, Cambridge University Press from 2021. And um, Ana, um, clashes between culture and law and religion are always challenging and the challenging topic of your talk will be um, Beyond Orient and Occident, Early Israeli Law and the Dilemma of Bigamy and Polygamy Among Eastern Communities. Okay. As I said, challenging. Okay. So many thanks, Galia, for this very kind and generous in, in invitation and presentation. And many thanks for the organizing committee and Professor Asha Moz in particular for inviting me to your celebrative uh, party. And I was really impressed by the honor and the, and the, and the uh, very interesting and celebrative event. So I'm also sharing my sense of gratitude to you and share my mazel tov with you as well. So um, I won't stretch your back this, uh, this part of the table. So I'll read some of the of the um, slides or the text I'll use, so don't stretch your back. But uh, and uh, we also have among us some some uh, uh, scholars who are so very much familiar with Hebrew. So I wouldn't trouble to translate the Hebrew text into English, but I'll use the I'll still use the English uh, translation. So the title is a little slightly uh, different from the original um, in, uh, original. Uh, title in the uh, in the program but rest assured it's the same uh, it's the same discussion it's the same uh, in, 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 in a paper which is part of my uh, LLM dissertation written under the supervision of Professor Juan Haris from Tel Aviv University Law Faculty but since then uh, I was developing this uh, some of the ideas and challenge, challenge legal challenges that I was dealing with in the LLM uh, dissertation, uh, LLM uh, thesis, and I would like to share, particularly in this um, in in uh, in this conference or this workshop, uh, some of the ideas. So, well, the my PhD supervisor, Dr. David Cho, always told me, Omer, don't be, uh, don't take the presentation or the or the uh, the panel right before lunch, but I skipped his uh, uh, very wise advice. So I'll use some pictures in order to. Um, Penny, can you assist me a bit? Okay, so we'll some pictures. Let me take, well, this uh, conference is dealing with building a better future. Uh, I'll try to, to linger a little bit more about the role of the Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli early law, but some very challenging, as I see it, some very challenging uh, interpretations of the tensions between law, culture, religion, of course, and the differences among uh, uh, this particular um, a part of the Middle East. So on the right, for example, you can see there uh, the writer of legal um, uh, requests and applications uh, in Arabic. That's in the city of, in the market city of, uh, uh, in the market of Gaza. Um, but, um, thanks. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. And thanks, Vinny. Okay. And on the right over here, you can also see, um, you can see writer of legal requests and affidavits in Hebrew, that's in Tel Aviv. We, we are not really sure in what is the exact year, but it's the early 50s, that's the period in which I'm focusing in my research. And over here, we can see a, a, a similar legal request writer in Hebrew and Arabic in front of the Akko or Accra Magistrate Court, that this picture was taken from in 1962. And over here, we are not very sure whether the writer is um, local, uh, indigenous Arab Muslim or, 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 or Jewish uh, person, but this, the way in which the legal system uh, worked as a common field for the this, uh, different cultures in the state of Israel seems particularly interesting in my view. So as an introduction, during the early 1950s, the Zionist revolution brought together the Arab population of the land and an enormous public of new Jewish immigrants, mostly strangers to the Western legal political tradition that the founding fathers struggled to establish during the first half of the 20th century and the early days of Zionism. 
The study which I'm about to present some part of which today was conducted in the context of the treatment of marginal groups that did not belong to the hegemony centers of the Israeli society in its first decades, particularly the new Jewish immigrants from North Africa and Middle Eastern countries, and also the indigenous Arabs who had been subjected to the new Israeli, Israeli law since 1948 and the establishment of the state. Through examination of legal text, I found that both these Eastern communities were the subjects of unique interactions between the Western legal system under construction, in, in literally under construction in the late 40s and the early 50s, and non-Western traditional practices, first and foremost concerning the institution of marriage. The former rulers of the land, over here we have Chemda, which is an AR, who are also very close friend with the legal history uh, department or community over here in Israel. So, so the former rulers of the land, the Ottoman Empire and the British Mandate for Palestine have had different experience with the question of bigamy in particular. Here in comparison to other studies that uh, have focused, which have focused on bigamy in the world of law, also elsewhere, not only in Israel. So over in my study, I tackled the interactions between the Supreme Court, the legal arrangements concerning traditional bigamy and the 1950s as the formative decade, as a very special decade in the peak, at the peak of the melting pot era in Israeli history. As I will briefly, and you know, it will be deep briefly uh, discussion, so as I will briefly discuss this morning or, or just before lunch, my study examines several intriguing cases of bigamy during the 1950s. I will present, or in the paper I'll present, some examples uh, of these challenging different case studies in which the Supreme Court deliberated over the question, and when it was doing so, it was doing so as a meeting point of, of religious, so very relevant to our conference today, so the meeting, meeting point of, of religious, social, ethnic, and cultural dimensions, both among Jews of Eastern origin, or Mizrahi, as we say in Hebrew, and also among, and in a comparative perspective, also among Arab Muslims. In some cases, as we shall see, the accused themselves ask for challenging comparative perspective and, uh, and, and also ruling by the court. To the court, however, the Supreme Court, both of these groups presented reflections of the East, and I will suggest new reading of the court's decisions. In a general perspective, the, at the heart of the study of my study stands a comparison between other interactions between early Israeli law and the way it, and, and the way it, 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 it sometimes captured the East in its, in its inhabitants and the unique cakes of the prohibition of bigamy in 1951. On the one hand, I focus on the cases of bigamy, while on the other hand, I discuss other examples for uh, other examples um, of orientalist reflections in the supreme court rulings in these legal uh, orientalist legal encounters some of the examples you can see over here um, and i'll discuss them in the in 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 other uh, articles that developed from the from the llm dissertation llm thesis that was mentioning so in these other orientalist legal encounters i stress that in some cases Although most, most certainly not in all of them, early Israeli law sometimes ascribed Eastern persons certain characteristics. That is, for instance, you can see it in the first example over here. So that is when it was engaged in social or communal efforts to restore peace in the village or hashavat uh, or achzarat in Hebrew. So, and, that's in, and the meaning is to withdraw criminal law in favor of other traditional mechanisms in Eastern Arab communities or sulcha as it says, as it called in Arabic. Studying, however, the bigamy cases and, take, and even taking into account the explicit prohibition, uh, prohibition um, in the written law of, the, of 1951, the Women's Equal Rights Law, which prohibited bigamy also on Arab Muslim, the court, the Supreme Court, did stay obliged to its role as recognized by its own word as social agent during the melting pot era. In the conclusion, or well, when we'll discuss it during the QA, I'll try to suggest another explanation besides that, uh, the one that, uh, which is satisfied with the introduction of the new law, the Women's Equal Rights Law of 1951, for the interesting differences in the court's approach towards different social phenomena that were presented as a reflection of Eastern or Oriental identities. <laughs> 
At this point of departure, this study presents the way in which certain trends, meaning the way the way the, um, the way law treated groups and individuals from non-Western uh, ethnic groups in in certain cases. So, how the way it, this way can be understood against the background of Edward Said theory. I shall propose a guided reading of some of these legal texts, a reading that seeks to identify the use of orientalist semantics or repetitive, um, repetitive albeit incrustate forms, symbols, and discourse in light of orientalism and the vast scholarship that has followed it. I argue that this series of legal texts reveals a discourse that can be interpreted, and I emphasize the word can, so it can be interpreted and understood using orientalist semantics, uh, oh, so fast, okay, so using orientalist patterns, uh, 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 images, and attributes. Along a series of rulings, I track the ways in which the court's understanding and considerations of motives and personality of certain persons can, uh, who appear before it can be, uh, are being revealed in the legal text and can be interpreted using some of Said's uh, theory. And of course, I'm very cautious about it and I'm very, um, and trying to be, um, uh, also familiar, of course, with the criticism against Said theory, especially in the Israeli context. But since Galia, and she's the chair, of course, honorable chair, uh, mentions that I only have a, a few minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly move to uh, the uh, to the case of the special case of bigamy and polygamy, and I'm focusing on a certain case, criminal pill one one two on fifty, Yosefov versus Attorney General. <clears throat> so. Um, Second, sorry. So I shall begin the journey or conclude the journey uh, taken, undertaken by the Israel jurisprudence on the question of, of, bigamy, of bigamy as the beginning of the 1950s when the new uh, legal system faced the challenges of the, the challenge of bigamy in rather a broad and, compre and comprehensive manner. The tension between the application of the prohibition on, of bigamy to Jews and the legal heritage uh, uh, of the British mandate uh, uh, throughout the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s until the termination of the British mandate. So the prohibition and the, um, and the continued tolerance, uh, toleration of bigamy among Arab Muslim community uh, that emerged in the case, so beautifully emerged in the case of Gad Yosefov from, uh, 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 from, 19, uh, from the 1950s. The applicable law was still the criminal court ordinance of 1936, the legacy left to Israel by the British. Okay, and that's section 181, for example. Okay, um, and so discussing the appeal of, uh, of the decision made by the district court, the district court uh, in the framework of which of, um, of which Yosef was convicted of violation of section of sec, uh, section uh, uh, one uh, one hundred uh, one eight one. So whoever has a living wife uh, or living husband and he or she marries a wife or husband and this marriage is void on uh, on account of of the living husband of wife is guilty of crime and faces five years of prison. This crime uh, shall be called bigamy. In his legal defense, however, Yosef has noted that the application of the section as it currently formulated in the early 50s operates in an equal fashion in regard to Jews, while Muslim Arabs enjoy the exemption of it. His appeal posed the challenges I see to the Israeli law already at the start of the road asking whether uh, this might uh, not be regarded as discrimination between Jews and Arabs in this young democracy. And I'm taking also into account that ACO, for example, was just um, it was uh, on, uh, under martial law until the early 50s, unlike other uh, Arab communities in Israel that uh, in which um, the martial law was canceled in 1966. In his answer, however, Justice Moshe Landau quotes the decision made by Judge Benjamin Halevi of the lower court. You can see it over here. The institution um, of uh, the institution of monogamous marriage. Um, um, such a second. The decision of monogamous marriage is considered in every nation, state, and uh, uh, in society where it exists as one of the highest values. Um, of human civilization, the existence of the family and the well-being of society depends on it. It is worthy of and needs the protection of the criminal law uh, where everywhere it exists in Eretz Israel, of the land of Israel, where it exists 
in so near to the institution of polygamous marriage, it needs even great protection. And my colleagues and friends from Israel are so very familiar with, uh, uh, and I'm finishing, I'm concluding, and so many familiar with, with many Mautner's um, uh, uh, thesis with regard to, to the transition from uh, the formative decade or from the um, uh, formative agenda of Israeli law to the more um, to the discourse of values and, and multicultural dimensions. So this case, for example, from the 1950s is a pretty long case shows or challenges, I think, if I may, some of many mountains uh, ideas. In certain, in certain sense, then some parts of Yosef of, uh, 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 of uh, appeal represents the transition stage between the mandatory period and the instantiation, instantiations of the creation of Israeli law. I claim that the phenomenon of bigamy, at first among Mizrahim, afterwards among Arab Muslims as well in the, in the second half of the 1950s, constituted a special challenge to the establishment of sovereignty in the Israeli context. Indeed, actually, already during the British mandate, some Jews were, prob uh, were brought to trial. Furthermore, at least to some Ashkenazi Jews of, of, you know, of Western uh, in, in origin, so at least, to, uh, at least some Ashkenazi Jews were also charged with a felony of bigamy. And yet, and as I elaborate in my study, and this, this, is some, this presentation is also some kind of a PR or invitation uh, to read some of, my, uh, some of my papers, not all of them, but maybe this one in particular, and yet, as I elaborate in my study, there were some intriguing differences in the way the Supreme Court conducted, conducted its discussion in a comparative perspective when it discussed Eastern polygamy in particular. And since I have just one more minute, so maybe we can, can conclude with this one. So you can see that the Eretz Israeli legislator, meaning that's me, it means that the British uh, uh, legislator, not the, the Israeli one, because we have the, um, the criminal ordinance of 1936. So the Eretz Israeli legislator discriminated neither in favor of this ethnic group, nor the, the determinant of another group. He found before him a diverse social and even legal reality of various ethnic groups, each with its own way of life. Anyhow, making a long story short, at the end, Yosef doesn't get the same uh, uh, protection of the law, and he's sent to jail for more than one year. So this case shows just in a, on, in a nutshell, the way in which so many differences and challenges brought in front of the Israeli Supreme Court in this very intense uh, decade of the 50s. And, I'm, um, and I will be happy to answer some more questions during the Q&A uh, phase or stage. So many thanks for that. Thank you, Dr. Aloni. Um, Thanks. <coughs> yeah. Thanks. Ah, okay. And Todaraba. Uh, this was really um, challenging and interesting. Um, we have time for really only very, very brief uh, questions. Uh, Professor Moss? I would like to make that. Just two points. The first one is that there is a connection between the easy way to divorce and the prohibition of bigamy. And we know it from Jewish history. About a thousand years ago, Rabbeinu Gershom decided to, put, to, to do away with the easy way of divorcing the wife. And he, uh, on the contrary, started otherwise. He, he, he uh, prohibited bigamy. My theory is that because he lived in, the, in a Christian country, Westreich has a different opinion because bigamy exists in Oriental Jewish communities. I think it's the influence of the Christian society. Anyway, he was aware of the fact that if he prohibits bigamy, then he does a little bit, a little favor to the women. They will be divorced easily because they, according to the Bible, when a husband found some, felt some wrong in his wife, he may divorce her. So this, he complemented this prohibition with the prohibition of divorcing the wife without her consent. Uh, the other, and, and if we move to the Muslim society, it's very easy to, uh, to divorce her. You have to pronounce three times talak and she's divorced. It may be illegal because of the Israeli law, but it's very easy. And the second point is that there is a big difference here between the rule of the book and the rule of life. Muslims don't, per, don't, first of all, date their wife, and they marry another one, and then divorce the wife and marry another one. 
up to four times and they keep all the four women at home. Now, there is also a question of, of uh, freedom of religion because there is a, uh, a conflict or, or a, a dispute whether a uh, Muslim man who can afford four wives is allowed to, to do so or is, or is uh, uh, commanded by the Islam to do it. So some regard the prohibition of, of bigamy as, a, as a, an infringement of the freedom of religion of the, uh, of, uh, the Muslims. And by the way, I, I had a, uh, a, a seminar many years ago at Tel Aviv University, mm -hmm. and I, we had an Arab, uh, an Arab participant who told us about his village. Everybody knows that guy. He has four wives, three are divorced, but then the fourth is not. So the three of us, remember I had a very, a, uh, a feminist in my group and she said, but why did she, does she agree? And he says, she should be grateful. She's an old woman, she's 40 years old. Who will take her? Whoa. Thank the husband for that. That's all, uh, watch it. Whenever I speak to new historians, I speak about periodizations. You're, you seem to be obsessed about periods and, and divisions to periods. Uh, I, I agree with, with Asher that the way to look about bigamy is not Orientalism of the 1950s, but you see the whole millennium, beginning from Rabbeinu Gershon Mor Agola and Rosh. Uh, the 11th century to 19, uh, 1950, where uh, Cherem and uh, uh, set as a rule that uh, bigamy is halakhically uh, uh, forbidden in Israel. Sorry, by the way, if I may interrupt, that was in order to enforce the monogamy on the Oriental Jews, but the, the Ashkenazi Jews had it from the from Gershon. Now, now, historically, it, it, it was a division between uh, uh, Jews influenced by Christianity and Jews influenced by the Islam. Uh, to, and it was even a political issue during the 12th and the 13th and the 14th century. It was a political issue. I mentioned last evening the Khalifi uh, uh, praising Salah Adin when uh, he conquered Jerusalem from, uh, from the Crusaders. Uh, Al Khalifi also wrote in misogyny uh, uh, a whole book. Misogyny in, 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 in the original historical sense, not in the figurative figurative uh, 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 colloquial way that we use the word today. And there was a whole uh, uh, line, or a whole genre of literature, for instance, Minchat Yehuda Somea Nashim, a Yehuda who hates women, that was all about this political dispute between people influenced by Islam and people influenced by Christianity, uh, on whether or not uh, we should accept monogamy as a Christian uh, uh, notion and, and Christian ideology. Uh, Christians were probably wrongly accused of uh, involving women in crusade fight as, as crusade fighters. This was probably a false accusation but it was very common among uh, Muslims at the time. Uh, and they also attributed this to the status of women among Christians. Uh, Jews was mostly in Spain prior the Reconquista thought of themselves as closer to the Muslims than to the Christians. Hence, they objected monogamy, Eastern Jews uh, uh, objected monogamy because they, they, they stood on the, on, on the other side of the uh, uh, fence of, of the political dichotomy, dichotomy of, of the world at that time. This existed throughout the second 
linen until uh, uh, the, the, the culmination or the, the conclusion of this dispute was in 1950, when in fact uh, 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 Western Jews influenced by Christianity forced uh, 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 traditional Jews and Jews uh, influenced by Islam to accept their values. Yeah. Sorry, want to finish? Okay, sure. And any more questions? Um, on, on this, <laughs> okay. Sorry. Just maybe one one Sorry. remark, if, if I may. Um, again, on, on on this topic, uh, just very briefly. Um, it seems uh, if if I can connect all this discussion to uh, to the discussion we're having these days on this issue. Uh, it appear it, it seems interesting that maybe Israeli law is a bit contradictory. Um, it criminalizes the women polygamy, but still um, the question now raised is the uh, legal entitlement to allowance, child allowance to families mm -hmm. with bigamy and uh, uh, polygamy. Um, and the by, question by the state. By, by the state. So there is uh, uh, a legal contradiction yes. here. And uh, um, well, okay, I'll be brief. So uh, that's basically I, the question. <laughs> I promise to be brief, very brief. So many thanks. Uh, thanks, Galia, and thanks, Ron. Well, Ron, it's a complete, uh, it's a very big discussion and a very, uh, um, and a very big question. I, I completely follow your, your um, way of presenting this dilemma. And you are right, of course, it's a very historical one. I'm just, what, I'm tr what I've tried is to show or to, or to present that the case of the transitional period between the, men that, the British mandate for Palestine and the creation of the Israeli sovereignty is seen in particular in a very interesting way in the case of Bigam, because the British also dealt with the same case. There's the Menni case, I didn't have the time to present. There's the same case, not Yosef, an Ashkenazi Jew that come in, in the 40s, he married several women in Jerusalem, Gad Melnik or Malchit, depends on the on the certain name, how it was written in the in, in the protocols and so on. So he married several women in Jerusalem and is brought in front of a criminal court in during the British, during the mandate. And the British asked uh, the grandfather of our current president, uh, President uh, President uh, uh, Yitzhak Bougie Herzog. So they asked his grandfather, well, tell us, please, uh, dear rabbi. Uh, whether, or not, whether or not bigamy is allowed to choose. And then the question of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, the, show, the, the question of bigamy, whether or not it should be Ashkenazi, which uh, prohibit uh, bigamy with Chem de Rabbeinu Gershon, or allow bigamy in accordance to certain Eastern uh, communities in Yemen, in Morocco, and all throughout the other regions in the Middle East. And then Rabbi Itzhak Herzog said, well, he, 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 he cannot say otherwise than that the Judean still allow certain communities in Judean still allow bigamy and polygamy, and then Melnik is um, is free to go, and then comes the Yosef case, and the Israeli Supreme Court doesn't ask any rabbi whether or not bigamy is allowed, but uh, uh, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef writes in 1974 that the case of bigamy and polygamy is an example in which. The, Ashken, uh, the Ashkenazi Judaism, um, the way in which Ashkenazi Judaism is taking uh, the lead or uh, withdrawing uh, Eastern communities or Eastern uh, Mizrahi traditions. So uh, Rabbi Yosef showed this uh, example in his view as a very uh, way, as a way in which Ashkenazi Jews overcome the Eastern traditions uh, in the Jewish world. Okay, uh, thank you, Omer. Uh, just a little sentence. Uh, there is the dispute actually is whether the prohibition of bigamy is stick to the head or to the land. And if it's stick to the head, then if you come from Morocco, you have the right to for bigamy. If it's the rule of the and then the question was what is the rule of the land? If you if you reminded Rabbi Isaac Herzog, he was the rabbi who stood behind the prohibition that or the harem that uh, Ron, Ron mentioned. Okay. But yeah. there's an, an issue I'm... here that is um, can be formed other than cultural differences, and that is that if you're creating a state and have citizens in a state, there has to be some 
norms. And you can argue how, how much those, how far those norms have to reach, but this is familiar in the United States to various kinds of practices that are seen as really assaultive of human rights. And if you're in a society that's democratic, that requires individuals to be protected, <laughs> then that trumps uh, because, in other words, if they were still living in whatever lands they were yeah. under those laws, that's one thing. Of course, with the cultural when defense. You have to have yeah. a state. There is a moment when you have to confront cultural differences and give in leeway, but not to uh, destroy the basic premises of a democratic society. Unless it wasn't going to be democratic, which may be coming. Okay, we will leave now the table for 10 minutes so lunch could be served. You can either sit here around or outside. We'll meet in about 10 minutes and we'll try to finish lunch at 1.30 so we'll be accurate with the program. Thank you.